It is my honor to present to you Stuart McLean, best-selling author, award-winning journalist, humorist, and host of the CBC radio program, The Vinyl Cafe. A Montreal native, Mr. McLean graduated from St. George Williams University with a BA degree in 1971. He went on to build a remarkable career which has included producing and hosting numerous shows that celebrate Canadian issues and identity. As a storyteller and radio personality, Mr. McLean has brought humor and affection into the homes of Canadians here and abroad. Mr. McLean began his broadcasting career making radio documentaries for CBC Radio's Sunday Morning. Following Sunday Morning, Mr. McLean spent seven years as a regular columnist and guest host on CBC's Morningside. His book, The Morningside World of Stuart McLean, was a Canadian bestseller and a finalist in the 1990 City of Toronto Book Awards. Stuart McLean a également signé le récit de voyage Welcome Home, Travels in Small Town Canada et a dirigé la publication du recueil de nouvelles « When We Were Young ». Il est triple lauréat de la médaille de l'humour Stephen Leacock pour ses œuvres « Home from the Vinyl Café »,« Vinyl Café Unplugged » et « Secrets from the Vinyl Café ». In December 2011, Stuart McLean was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada. He is a professor emeritus at Ryerson University and former director of the Broadcast Division of the School of Journalism. He is the recipient of numerous honor degrees and has served as honorary colonel of the 8th Air Maintenance Squadron at 8 Wing, Trenton, from 2005 to 2008. Best known for his stories about the fictional Toronto family of Dave, who runs the Vinyl Cafe record store, his wife Morley, and their children, Stephanie and Sam, Mr. McLean offers the mishaps, confusions, and misunderstandings of this very Canadian family and of their neighbors and friends with wry humor and great affection. With a keen sense of dramatic timing, Mr. McLean tells his stories in his distinctive voice that has captivated, enthralled, and delighted his audiences, both on air and in performance. Depuis 1998, il présente son vinyl café aux quatre coins du Canada, de St. John's à Terre-Neuve, à Whitehorse au Yukon, et des États-Unis, de Bangor, dans l'État du Maine, à Seattle, dans l'État de Washington. Tous les week-ends, l'émission rejoint plus de 1,5 million d'auditeurs à la radio de la CBC et à la radio satellite Sirius, de même que par l'entremise d'un nombre grandissant de stations radiophoniques publiques aux États-Unis. Vinyl Café est également diffusé à l'occasion sur les zones de la BBC. Mr. Deputy Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate and the Board of Governors, it is my privilege and honor to present to you Stuart McLean, so that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa.
I would like to ask Dr. Stuart McLean to give his remarks. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Chancellor, Mr. Chairman of the Board of Governors, Mr. President and Vice Chancellor, honored platform guests, graduating class, family and friends. 43 years ago, a younger version of me walked across this stage and convocated from a younger version of this university by the skin of my teeth. I needed a makeup ear to make it out, as I needed a makeup ear in high school to get in. Five years ago, five years ago, I stood on this stage for the second time and performed one of my vinyl cafe shows and to a sold out house, I might add. And when it was done, I received a standing ovation. My mother was here that night. She was sitting right down there. Someone came up to her after the show and said, you must be very proud. She replied, more surprised than proud. <laughs> and then she said, we never really expected him to amount to very much. Well, that's for you moms and dads here today who are worried about what is going to happen now. Is your son or daughter going to amount to much? Well, I was 46 before I started the Vinyl Cafe, which is what has brought me back here today for the third time. Good things take time. Have faith. But it's not faith that I want to talk about today. And I want to use the few short minutes I have to address my fellow graduates rather than those of you sitting in the cheap seats. <laughs> and because I'm, a, because I'm here as a storyteller, I'll begin with a story. A story about something that happened neither 43 nor 5 years ago. It happened last spring near Antigonish, Nova Scotia. <laughs> I knew you'd be here. <laughs> well, you may remember it. You may have heard me speak of it on the radio. A lobsterman working near Antigonish found a blue lobster in one of his traps. I am talking about a neon blue lobster. It's a rare, though not unheard of, thing caused by a genetic defect. The odds about one in two million. Sheldon Trenum of South River was the lucky lobsterman. And I say lucky because after word got out, Sheldon received a call from the Smithsonian Institute. And he was able to sell his blue lobster for almost a million dollars, making it the most valuable lobster ever caught. And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Sheldon Trenum, you see, is a single father. And his son wanted to go to university, but had been working on the family lobster boat instead because they couldn't afford school. And the million dollars meant that Sheldon's son could afford a college. And I thought it was a lovely thing that working on the lobster boat, the thing that kept him from school, became the thing that sent him. Nice story, right? That's not true. Oh, there was a blue lobster, and it was caught by Sheldon Trenum of South River, Nova Scotia. And the odds of catching a lobster like that are one in two million, but I have no idea if Sheldon is married or has a son or what his circumstances might be. Though knowing he is a lobsterman, I think it is a safe bet that he could use a few extra bucks. And I'm sure as he stood there on his lobster boat holding that blue lobster, that it occurred to him that someone would have bought it, if not for a million, for a serious amount of money. So let me tell you what actually happened. Sheldon took a few pictures, showed a few friends, and then he threw the lobster back in the ocean. Why? Because the lobster was too small to keep. Sheldon followed the rules. 
And I thought today, on this day of days, it was a good time to take note of that because your graduation today from is also a graduation to. For when we go, we always go from a thing to another. When we walk away, we walk towards. So as you walk away today from school, from these days of good times and hard times, from these days of fellowship and solitude, from tests and term papers, from coffee cups and all-nighters, from the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's. <laughs> it's possible that you'll catch the odd blue lobster yourself. If you were a student still, I would forgive you the impulse to take it home so you could study it. But you are no longer a student, you are a graduate. And the degree that will be conferred upon you in a moment not only marks your graduation from school, it marks your graduation to, well, to many things. But the thing I would like to suggest is that it marks your graduation to citizenship, full citizenship. And as a newly graduated citizen, I would like to ask you to reflect on the duties and responsibilities that come with that. As citizens, we come together through our governments. That's how we talk amongst ourselves. And it has become accepted wisdom these past few years that governments represent the worst of us. I want you to consider the opposite might be true. That rather than our worst selves, we have been our best selves and done our best work when we have come together. There are so many things we have done well together, things of which we can be proud. The way we look after those of us who are ill or too old to look after themselves or those who might hurt themselves or others. The way we move the mail around the way we serve and protect, all of these things and so many more are a result of us saying we are all in this together. And I know, like you, I read the newspapers and I'm privy to the inefficiencies, large and small, all the blunders and all the missteps, but is efficiency the yardstick by which we will measure our lives? I'm a writer. And I write, and I rewrite, and I rewrite again, draft one and two and three, and then I show my best effort to my editor, and inevitably she asks me to do it again. And that's the best of times. Surely after all the practice I have had, surely after all of these years, the first draft, the efficient draft, should be enough. Never was, and it isn't still. And so it is with every important thing I do. I'm an inefficient cook, an inefficient lover, an inefficient father. In fact, I think my best work is inefficiently done. <laughs> I don't want to celebrate inefficiency. That's not what I'm trying to say. I just don't want us to throw out the baby with the bathwater. As citizens, we must remember how inefficient we all are how hard it is to get four friends to agree on one movie, how difficult it is to organize a family reunion, how complicated it can be to plan a wedding. Imagine what it is like getting 33 million people marching in a similar direction. But we have and we do. We stop on the red, we go on the green. And if we disagree with our neighbor or if our neighbor disagrees with us, we don't hack each other to death anymore. We talk about it in person or in court. <laughs> we have institutions where we work things out. And we have come to this happy state because people like you, thoughtful people like you, have made the effort to seek the deepening gift of education and once educated, come to the understanding that coming together is better than staying apart. And here we get to the nub of it. It costs money to do that. So we all agree we'll throw some money into the kitty. 
we pay our taxes. And though there are scoundrels and wastrels and self-serving fools who will betray our trust and whose misbehavior might make us wonder if we should misbehave too, it behooves us to remember that the rascals usually get their due. So what I want to say to you today is this. It now is your turn to contribute. And the way you'll do that is through your taxes and through your votes. You are a citizen now. You have no choice. Your choice is how you will accept the responsibility of citizenship. What I'm asking is just this. Do it joyfully. Spread optimism rather than cynicism. Act with the understanding that we are all in this together that when we act together, we can keep the wolf from the door. Throw your piece of the pie back into the pot, knowing you get much more back in return. It is an honor to be a citizen of this rich land and to be able to contribute. Do it happily. Do it gracefully. Do it with gratitude. And most importantly, when the day comes that you pull your blue lobster out of the sea, call your friends over, take a few pictures, and then chuck it back in the water. Play by the rules. When you were a child, you spoke as a child. You understood as a child. You thought as a child. But now you are an adult. It is time to put away childish things. Thank you for the honor you have uh, given me today and for listening. I would like to uh, thank Dr. McLean for his remarks. Um, unlike his mother, he did not surprise us. And furthermore, I think he's amounted to a great deal. <laughs>